Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Oh, you want me to? to I will say sign out anyway. Otherwise, I send a rude email to the vice chancellor on your behalf. <laughs> Please don't dump me in. <laughs> Have a lovely day. Wonderful good morning everybody. Good morning. good morning. Lovely good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful good morning. Most wonderful good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Morning.
Have you guys got another deadline or something like that coming up? No, because... Uh, yeah, yeah, but that, that's not a deadline. That's, that's, that's a joke. No, because uh, not many people are around. Or is that the only lecture that uh, is on today? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the only one? Yeah. The double one. Uh, that explains it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, makes sense. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Will it make any difference where you sit? We just want to be as close to you as possible. As close to you as possible. Uh, to me? Yeah. yeah. Just extra credit because you think, wow, these guys are so dedicated, they sit right at the front. So then you won't notice when I'm not here after Wednesday tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, right? Not a single flying flamingo was given. <laughs> I really meant to come to the one last Thursday as well. Same. I like went home. Fair enough. I went home very early from Wednesday and I was like, I'm going to be in Clapper's Lecture. Listen, it doesn't make any difference. Well, it does make a difference. I, 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 of course, I like to see people, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, you guys are old and ugly enough to make your own decision. Thank you. Right? I'm old. You are. <laughs> anyway, shall we get started, yeah? Before I insult more people. Good morning, everybody. I, I, I just inquired because usually I expect a little bit more turnout, uh, but I realized this is the only session or today that you have. Uh, and I mean, I'm, 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 very, I'm very glad that uh, you are here, that you made the effort. Um, and if you are here, please go on to whatever device you have and register your attendance on Moodle. Wherever in the world you are, just click the I'm here button. Um, or if you like, you can also press the I'm absent button, but I still haven't discovered uh, what the point is of this uh, I'm absent. It's a little bit like when you travel to the uh, US or Australia, uh, you have to fill in a, a little uh, declaration card. Are you a terrorist? And uh, you know, if you say yes, they think you take the pi piss uh, and uh, Come here, talk to me. Uh, so far, I don't think anyone has ever done that in uh, full seriousness, uh, said, yes, I'm a terrorist. Uh, I know a colleague of mine uh, went to Australia and had to fill in uh, one of these cards uh, where it said, are you convicted of any crimes? And he put a note down and said, I didn't know that this was still a requirement to enter Australia. Uh, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, so please register your attendance. Uh, on the group chat, I think it was on Sunday or something like that, I posed the question, uh, what kind of assessment you want in this module, whether you want an in-class test, I think that is in week 21, it would be a one-hour problem-solving test, similar to the BI-308 test that you done last year, or whether you would prefer online quizzes. And I had, I think, uh, 16 replies. Uh, one person said they prefer an in-class test. So I would consider this as probably the majority wanting online quizzes. 
although I will show you in BI308 how you properly analyze data like that, right? And there's a little twist to it. But from 15 out of 16 who answered, I take it it's probably the majority would like these online quizzes um, and not the in-class test. However, if you think that this is a problem and you don't want the online quizzes, please send me an email, right? And we can sort things out. The online quizzes, <clears throat> I haven't decided how many there will be, but uh, they will be usually, you can do them as often as you like, and only the, the top score counts. Similar to the BI 308 uh, that most people are currently doing. And um, BI 301, the enzymes module, this one here, has then these online quizzes and an assessed practical. Uh, we start, I think, with the assessed practical in week 16. Uh -huh. We start in week 16, and the assessed practical for this module, there is a slight twist to it, uh, which I'm, I'm not going to reveal at the moment, right? So hang on, sit tight with that. There will be also one quiz in it that's a little bit different, but again, you will find out. So don't worry about it, okay? So what I want to do with you today is this famous Michaelis-Menten equation, which allows us to do a little bit of quantitative stuff with enzymes. And last week, I uh, did a sort of an introduction session to enzymes, what enzymes are, what they are not doing. So an enzyme cannot change the equilibrium of a reaction, but it can make the reaction go fast. And we will discuss that a little bit uh, today. How fast is fast? Um, I also emailed you a sort of a playlist and I asked you to look at uh, the first six uh, sort of tutorials. You will need them for some of the quizzes, this playlist, okay? Um, there are also questions about this stuff that we are doing on my practice calculation website under enzymes, so please have a look at that as well. It's definitely worth uh, doing. Um, now, this Michaelis-Menten equation, uh, it was developed in uh, 1913 by, uh, let's see if I get this right, uh, Leonard Menten, no, Leonard Michaelis, a German biochemist, and Maud Menten, uh, uh, she was a Canadian physical chemist or something like that. And that was around the time when chemists uh, were quite interested actually in how uh, certain substances bind to uh, surfaces. And they developed the, the, the tools actually to describe these things. Um, before we go into Michaelis Menten, I just want to do a brief uh, revisit of kinetics in BI308. Yes, I know. It's the horrible stuff, the K word. And uh, for example, we said uh, sometimes we have a reaction A is converted into P. What we will find that when we talk about enzymes, we usually don't use the uh, symbol A for a reactant. We usually use S, which just simply stands for substrate. Substrate is converted into a product. And we said we can describe the rate of a reaction the rate of the reaction would be, <coughs> excuse me, 
a change in s per change in time, uh, which of course would also be in this case change in product per time. And we said in the easiest form, or we would find uh, in this case for rate k times s to the power of zero. Just remind me what kind of reaction would that be? What order would this be? If it is to the power of zero, it is? It's a zero order reaction, right? And if we, for example, plot, we have rate and we have S for, and what we do is we just take, we don't care about the sign. Uh, in this case, uh, we said that for a zero order reaction, we would get basically a parallel to the x axis, which basically indicates that the rate of this reaction is totally independent of the substrate concentration. Doesn't matter how much substrate we add, how much substrate we have present, the reaction would always go at the same rate, at the same speed. Yeah, you remember that? So that would be typical of a zero order. We could also have a first order where we have, let's say, ds over dt, and we don't care about the sign, equals k times substrate concentration to the power of 1. And now Alex is right with his first uh, order reaction. Obviously, it's a first order reaction because we have the order 1. That's the order here. And don't forget the order of a reaction is just a mathematical um, formulation that uh, we can use to describe the, this reaction. It does not indicate how many molecules have to crash into each other to make this reaction go. And we can, again, we can do this. So we can plot that rate versus substrate concentration. And we would find that the more substrate we have, the faster the reaction would go. So it would be basically a straight line. Yeah, makes sense? We've done that. You remember that uh, it's all pretty straightforward. Because we will come now across a reaction. We will come across an equation which is simple, deceptively simple. It is so simple that it causes headaches for, I would say, millions of students and researchers. It looks really, really simple. But if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff in it. Now, I am not deriving this equation. If you really must know how this equation is developed, there is a whole article in Wikipedia, and you can please fill the Menten equation, and they show you how this is derived. I'm not showing you that. I'm not expecting you to know this, uh, this, how, how you get to this equation. But the equation you must know. The equation 
just simply reads as rate, which is usually abbreviated with V, equals a term called Vmax. I'm just writing things down. Don't worry if you don't get them. Vmax times the substrate concentration divided by a term called Km plus the substrate concentration. This is the famous michaelis menten equation. Looks simple, doesn't it? There's nothing terrible to it. But this equation, you must memorize. And with this equation, there is something weird going on. But first things first. Let's first come up with a sort of a reaction scheme for which this equation was developed. Let's say we have a substrate, S. This substrate binds to the enzyme. And an enzyme is E. This binding process is usually reversible. Like that. And the two form an enzyme substrate complex. This was actually the starting point for the development of this michaelis menten equation, where people looked at, say, a surface E where ligands or receptors E were ligands bound to it. And if you think about it, I think all of you have just dealt with something like that, haven't you? Biological chemistry coursework phase something. You just recently submitted that, didn't you? <coughs> In Dinovia. Sorry? Not everyone did it. Not everyone did it. Not everyone did it. Who did it? Hands up. I think the vast majority, thank you. This was exactly what you did. You just had some different expressions for it. We have, of course, because this is a reaction, we have some rate constants for it. So let's call that one here K1. And let's call the reverse reaction K minus 1. OK, so we form an enzyme substrate complex. Good. But then obviously, something happens to the substrate, and it is converted into a product. So we convert it into a product. And what we get, remember last lesson, we said an enzyme is not consumed. We get the enzyme back plus the enzyme. We get the enzyme returned. And the enzyme can start a new cycle. Grab another substrate, bind it, convert it to product. Next. 
Next. Do, 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 do. I don't know whether enzymes make noises, but uh, perhaps they do. So that would be our reaction scheme. Let's call this conversion from enzyme substrate to product plus enzyme. Let's call this K2. And of course, you can argue that in real life, you also have the reverse reaction from product back the other way. So that would be K minus 2. Right. Now, what we can do is we can say, when will be our reaction at total full speed? Our reaction, full speed, Actually, full speed is not a really great technical term. Full speed is usually abbreviated as maximum rate, and that's called Vmax. Vmax is, that is the maximum speed this reaction can actually happen. And we get this when every single enzyme molecule is actually busy converting a substrate into product. <coughs> Vmax is, we achieve Vmax when every single enzyme molecule is engaged. And it turns out that we can describe that in a mathematical uh, in a mathematical equation we can say Vmax equals K2, that's our rate constant here, <coughs> times every single enzyme engaged, that would be times E total. All of the enzymes, the total enzyme concentration is involved in this K2. Uh, in this in this Vmax. That's one of the equations that we also need to sort of remember. That's our Vmax. An enzyme can't go faster than Vmax. And you reach this Vmax only when the enzyme is totally saturated. Similar to your HIV protease that you dealt with, you reach 100% of the saturation, basically, when you throw in loads and loads and loads of your inhibitor. Actually, you will never reach 100%. I think that was one of the questions. Yeah, was it? Can you ever reach it 100%? No, you can't. And I'll show you in a minute why you can't. So that's Vmax. And that is one part of our equation. We have another part, Km. If 
you remember, you had in your coursework, you had something similar to Km. Because if you look at this equation here, does that look remotely familiar to you? If I write it in a slightly different form, V equals V max times L over Km plus L, and that's sort of slightly different. I just substituted the S. Now I divide it by V max, and I get V over V max equals L over K A plus L. And instead of V max, V over V max, I just simply call this theta. Does that look familiar? Yeah? You've dealt with that. This is exactly the same equation. Just we divided it. And this theta gives us an expression of how much of V max we have achieved. Nothing else in percentage. So theta can be between 0 and 100%, or between 0 and 1, if you don't like percentage. That was one of the things that people uh, found a bit weird. But let's go back to our question, what is this Km? Km, it is also called the Michaelis constant. is similar to this Ka, but here we have the problem that we have not just this K1 and K-1, we have another constant in it, this K2. And I'm deliberately not talking about K-2, and the reason for that will become clear in a minute. So Km is just simply a mixture of these rate constants. It is k minus 1 plus k2 over k1. That is this km. And you can say, so what? Who cares? What, what does this Km? What is the meaning of Km? What is the meaning of Vmax? Well, Km tells us about the affinity of the enzyme for a substrate. KM tells us how much the enzyme likes the substrate. OK, so how do we need to figure that out? Um, how can we envisage that? What does affinity actually mean? Right, so Alex, yes. question for you. Yes. 
what is your affinity for a nice vegan breakfast? I mean, I don't eat breakfast. You don't eat breakfast. Don't be awkward, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's your affinity to vegan nut roast? Very high. Very high. Very high affinity. What's your affinity to sliced liver with onions? incredibly low. So you get an idea of what, so you don't like onions. I like liver. Oh, you don't like the, uh, so, okay, fair enough. Yeah, affinity ha means, in this case, how much does the enzyme like the substrate? But Km has a slightly different twist to it because Km is defined as the substrate concentration It is the substrate concentration at which we achieve half of the maximum speed. Now, if you think about it, what does that mean? If we say, for example, an enzyme has a very high affinity for the substrate. It really loves the substrate. So we need only a very, very small amount of substrate to get the enzyme going. So high affinity. means we only need small amounts. of substrate to get it going. Or in other words, our Km is low. only need a few substrate molecules and the enzyme is off. Low affinity, like Alex and the liver, we need to have loads and loads of substrate present so that the enzyme does something with it. So low affinity means we need loads of substrate and Km is high. We need lots of this stuff. What's the unit for Km? Well, the unit for Km is the same. You don't even need to think about a lot for the unit, because it's already given here in this equation. You can't add things up that have different units. So uh, a little bit like adding apples and bananas. What do you what do you get when you have when you add apples and bananas together? Well the argument would be fruit salad. Right? But actually you can't do it. So 
in order to add things up, you, things have to have the same unit. So what's the unit for the S? Told you, that would be concentration, of course. And therefore, the unit for Km is concentration. So millimolar or molar or micromolar or something like that. That's the unit for Km. So now we have all our ingredients. We have defined them. Uh, let's just simply write down this equation again. V, the rate, equals Vmax times S, substrate concentration, divided by Km plus S, plus the substrate concentration. That's our rate. When can we actually apply this michaelis menten equation? And there are some serious restrictions on it. Only applies if it turns out that this equation can only be used <coughs> the substrate concentration is much, much larger than our enzyme concentration. If it is similar, or if we have more enzyme than substrate, the equation doesn't work. The the way it is written it only works for one substrate. No, we don't have, we, we have only one substrate in there. And this is actually a fairly serious restriction because usually when we have an enzyme reaction, we have a reaction where there are two things that are put together. <coughs> Technically speaking, michaelis menten only works for one substrate. But in, I think, the week after next, we will discuss how we can overcome this problem when we have more than one substrate. This reaction <coughs> only works if our product concentration is zero. No product must be formed at that time. we we'll come back to that in a minute. And let me just quickly write down E plus S, E S, E plus P. We said K1, K minus 1, K2, K minus 2. And it only works if this reaction is irreversible. 
Or in other words, k minus 2 is 0. So it can't go back. It can only move in one direction. Now, of course, the third point, if p equals 0, we usually never have that case in a living cell because there's always some product being formed. Yet there is a slightly modification of the michaelis menten equation, which I am not going to show you because that would send a few people into serious hyperventilation. Right, so we don't do that. But there is an equation for the reversible michaelis menten but it makes things a little bit more fiery. We don't need that at the moment. So what? when we want to do experiments, we need to bear in mind these issues that we have. It's only valid for one substrate. Okay, we can potentially deal with that, and I'll tell you how we deal with that later on. Substrate concentration needs to be very high compared to the enzyme. That's why we only need a little bit of enzyme, diddly squats for the enzyme, because the enzyme is a catalyst. It's constantly recycled. Yeah? So that's we. That's why we need only small, small, small amounts for the reaction. Irreversible, uh, that's a bit of a problem. And even worse, P. We must not form any product when we look at this equation. Uh, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? The enzyme is supposed to produce a product, but then we can't describe it with michaelis menten because it only works if no product is produced. So a little bit squaring the circle. So, well, we can do something about that. We can actually say whenever we measure an enzyme reaction, We look at it, we make all our measurements all the measurements of the rate right at the start of the reaction. What do we gain with that? Well, if we just have substrate there and throw the enzyme in, no product has been formed. And therefore, we are within the confines of these rules. No product has been formed. If we wait, then product will be formed, or we can no longer use michaelis menten so we always need to measure things straight at the beginning of the reaction, just sort of almost milliseconds after we have started the reaction. Of course, sometimes this is not possible, but again, we will discuss how we can work around this. So. Our rates that we measure have a special name. When we do them right at the beginning, they are called initial rates.
And the great thing about initial rates is it is basically right at the beginning. No product has, f has been formed. And if no product has been formed, the reaction can't go backwards. Yeah? So we need to measure it right at the beginning. And I'll show you next week how we measure it right at the beginning. Are you happy with that? Yeah? So these are really important restrictions. There's another restriction, but that's not terribly important for us at the moment. The enzyme should not have several binding sites for the substrate, and these binding sites should not talk to each other. Sounds very esoteric, but uh, the week after in one of the subsequent lectures, we will discuss exactly that case. So don't worry about it. We will cover it. So we have our michaelis menten We know the restrictions. Now, let's look at one thing that we need to discover. We said Vmax equals K2 times our total enzyme concentration. Km equals K minus 1 plus K2 over K1. What happens if we increase the enzyme concentration, the total enzyme concentration, to these two parameters, to this Vmax and Km. They are, they are actually, Vmax and Km are called key parameters for an enzyme. There is a third one, but usually people don't use that very often, but I'll show you because I think it's very, very important. These are the two major parameters of an enzyme reaction. What happens if we change the enzyme concentration? What happens to Vmax? Is Vmax dependent on the enzyme concentration? What do you think? Does Vmax depend on the enzyme concentration? Yeah, of course, because <coughs> We have an enzyme concentration. So Vmax changes with enzyme concentration. Or in other words, the higher the enzyme concentration, the higher Vmax. Does Km change with the enzyme concentration? Does Km change? Km is basically a mixture of rate constants. Think about it, constants. These rate constants stay constant, right? They don't give a, a toss about the enzyme concentration. So Km independent of enzyme concentration. I can add as much enzyme as I want. Km will always stay the same. Doesn't give a damn. Yeah? This is going to be a question in your final exam. Oh, shit. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. Does that make sense? 
just a very brief sort of naming the beast again before we have a, a short break. When we have this Vmax and E total, we said Vmax depends on the enzyme concentration. And it turns out that you know if you want to compare enzymes, it's a pain because you can't really use Vmax because it's always depending on your enzyme concentration that you have used. So you really can't use that, but you can use something else. You can actually take this K2, this rate constant, K2, and it is usually identified as the slowest step And K2 equals, of course, we just simply rearrange this equation, Vmax over E total. So with this little trick, we get K2, and K2 is no longer really uh, dependent on anything because we have the Vmax and the E total, and uh, they you know, neutralize each other. So we get K2. What we can do is we can compare these K2s of different enzymes. K2 actually has also two different names, which you will find them. K2 is also very often, especially in a simple reaction like that, is called K-cat, the catalytic constant. In contrast to K1 and K-1, they are called the binding constants. K-cat is the catalytic constant. And the cool thing is, it tells us how often the enzyme actually deals with a substrate molecule. KCAT is also called the turnover number. And we can very easily calculate the turnover number if we have Vmax and our total enzyme concentration. Just to give you an idea of what turnover numbers can be, the enzyme chemotrypsin, I just simply abbreviate it as CT, for that K-cat is 0 0.14 per second. It means it can deal with one molecule of enzyme deals with 0 0.14 molecules of the substrate. In this case, it's a protein. 0 0.14 molecules of substrate per second. It's pretty slow. On the other end of the spectrum, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, CA, has a turnover number of 1 times 10 to the 5 per second. That means one molecule of this enzyme deals with 100,000 molecules of its substrate per second. Blimey, that's fast. 
is probably roughly sort of the range in which enzymes should, should work. OK, happy with that? So that is the turnover number. And again, it will be an exam question. Why do I do that to myself? OK, it will be an exam question. You have to calculate a turnover number. 7.5 minutes break, and then I show you actually how we deal with data. See you in seven and a half. Reacts with the product. With the substrate. With the substrate, yeah. We don't want an enzyme to react with a product. Don't. Okay. Yeah. It's always the substrate. And then. Okay. And that's Make sense? It. Yes. So, so it's just K2 that's K cat. K2 equals K cat. What about like K minus 1? K minus 1 and K1. Yeah. If you remember. They are in the first step. That's yeah. the binding of the substance. They are usually referred as the binding constant. Binding or dissociation constant. So is K minus one K? Sorry? Is, sorry, is K minus two K? K minus two is zero. Okay. We don't, we don't deal with K minus two. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Otherwise the reaction would not be irreversible and we would have to use a different equation for that. Yeah, makes sense? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, okay? sorry, I was like a massive pain. No, 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 no. You, you have accommodation. Yeah, yeah. With your sister. Yeah. She's and nine. Obviously, she they would... have cancelled. Yeah, uh, yeah, I went to email. double check and they said yeah. as soon as they got your email, they sorted it. Thank you. Pleasure. You're Have you done that stuff in A-level? No. Sorry? Or, okay, good. So new stuff. Good. Richard, have you done that in A-level? No? You've done biology A-level. Yeah. But from a school's perspective, it, I can see why they would do that. Yeah, you want you want the school to look good. Yeah. It should be education driven, not lead table driven. Well, I mean, memorizing, you shouldn't do memorizing anyway. Um, but hey. Have you done something like that in A levels? No. Good. Excellent. So it's something new. This morning, so we've got a bit of chill. You're cold. I don't want to say that, but I'm sweating like a pig. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm walking around, I guess. 
feel free to walk around <laughs> if that helps. Sorry. I don't know how to how to crank up the, the heating here. Um, go up because warm air goes up. So it's usually warmer up there. If I go any higher, I'll fall asleep. I have to be down here. Look. Okay. Okay. It's Fair like, enough. It's like a good. It's a good balance. I I, I can see the issues. Yeah. Yeah. There's no winning at this point, but it's fine. Your mom probably will be quite happy to see something like that. She's a research. Me, mom. Yeah. My mom's teacher. It's teacher. Emily, you're talking about. No, no, no. Lilu. Yeah. Didn't you say that uh, your mom was a research scientist or something like oh, that? Oh, my aunt is. Ah, but okay. Oh, uh, I unfortunately missed the previous no, workshop, and I was trying to find which video it was on YouTube. Is it uploaded? The You mean the live stream yeah. for, for BI301? Yeah, for Wednesday's uh, it, live Yeah, it should be up there. Uh, <laughs> I can put it on the group chat. Thank you. How, how will I identify it? So you don't have to... Uh, what I can do is a sort of... I can make a, a, a document where I have to... Like I do for BI308, where I have the different weeks and put that up with the live streams. That would be great if you could do it. Consider it done. Have you guys done something like that in A levels or something? No. No? So totally new stuff. Entirely. Sorry? Entirely. Yes! Yes! I might have had a lecture in Wednesday, but he was one who was 
very um, proactive in trying to get us to learn as much as possible. Like, mm -hmm. overall. So not like me, who is just telling you everything. <laughs> Okay, shall we reconvene? Now, be before I get you to draw some graphs yourself, I quickly want to go back to this michaelis menten equation and go through a few scenarios with you. So let's write mm down again. Vmax times s divided by km plus s. And let's just simply play with some of these Things. Let's just play with the substrate concentration. Let's say our substrate concentration is much, much larger than Km. What happens to this equation? Let's try to figure out what happens to it. So the substrate concentration is much, much larger than the affinity. What we can actually do is we can write Km plus the substrate concentration is probably very close to the substrate concentration. You can do that yourself. For example, put substrate concentration, let's say, value of 1,000 Km1. So 1,000 plus 1 gives you 1,001, which is pretty close to 1,000, to the substrate concentration. Yeah? That's why we can write it like that, Km plus S. It's pretty close to S in this case. What happens to our michaelis menten equation? V equals Vmax times S divided by Km plus S. And because it is Km plus S is so close to S, I just simply write that as S, roughly. S cancels out. And we've got V equals V max. Hey, wait a moment. It says rate does not depend on the substrate concentration. 
Let's think about it. What does that mean? The rate no longer depends on the substrate concentration. What kind of reaction order do we have? It's a zero-order reaction. Zero-order reaction, the rate does not depend on the substrate concentration. So we have zero-order. Or we can turn that around and say Vmax tells us Vmax indicates how the enzyme behaves at substrate concentration very, very high. That is the Vmax value. When the substrate concentration is incredibly high. We will only achieve the substrate, we will only achieve Vmax with infinite substrate concentration, but that's nonsense, of course. But that is what Vmax tells us. Okay, let's do the other extreme. Substrate concentration is much, much smaller than Km. So we can write Km plus S is very close to, what is it this time? What do you reckon? Km. Exactly. So substrate, let's put that one. Km, let's put it 1,000. Together, gives us 1,000, which is pretty close to our Km. We now can write our Michaelis-Menten equation. We can write this as Vmax times S. And instead of Km plus S, I just simply write Km. Hey, look at that. If we just simply say Vmax over Km, we take that as a sort of a constant. What rate order is that? Alex? Uh, first order, exactly. Because you always say one or first. <laughs> you knew it. Of course you knew it. So it's a first order reaction. Now Km over Vmax is actually the third parameter that I talked about earlier. Km over Vmax tells us <coughs> how enzyme behaves at substrate concentration extremely low. When we have hardly any substrate present, then Km over Vmax is a great value. It tells us how the enzyme behaves at very low substrate concentrations. Make sense? Now you probably have noticed something. You probably have noticed that at very low substrate concentrations, we have a first order reaction. 
at very high substrate concentrations, we have a zero order reaction. That's weird. Because that tells us that what we learned last year Okay. <coughs> what we learned last year that, you know, we either have a first or a zero order reaction or a second order or God knows what. In this case, the Michaelis Menten equation, the rate order actually depends on the substrate concentration, which is a pain because you can't define the rate order. It constantly changes because if you think about it, the enzyme does the reaction, so it takes a little bit of substrate, converts it into a product. Ah, substrate concentration changes. Rate order changes. Bugger it. I want to go home. That is what makes the michaelis menten equation really, really interesting. One more thing. What happens if our substrate concentration is exactly Km, the michaelis menten constant? Well, rate equals Vmax times S over Km plus S. And instead of Km, I just simply write S, yeah, in this case here. So I can write it as Vmax times S over, well, S plus S. What is S plus S? 2S yeah. equals Vmax times S over 2s. Oh, actually, I can cancel out s. Hey, look at that. V equals 1 half of V max. <coughs> actually, this is exactly what I told you earlier, isn't it? That Km gives us the substrate concentration at which we get half of the maximum speed. And Km actually tells us about the affinity. So wouldn't it be great to find a way how we can determine Km, how we can determine Vmax, how we can determine Vmax over Km? Because if we've got that, then it tells us how the enzyme behaves at very low substrate, at very high substrate, and it tells us about the affinity. So it would be cool if we could determine from experimental data what these values are, these three key parameters, Vmax, Km, Vmax over Km. And of course you can, because otherwise I wouldn't be harping on about it. Here's your favorite program, Excel. Just a little tip, get used to it. Excel, most people say, oh no, I don't like it, and tough, suck it up, because so far, I have not encountered a problem that I could not solve in Excel. Excel is cool. Sorry to break that news to you, but Excel is the program. Excel is boss. So here we have substrate concentration.
substration, and we give the substrate to our enzyme preparation, and we measure how fast the reaction runs. And of course, we have to measure it right at the beginning at what I called the initial rates. The initial rates. But we can do that, and I'll show you next week how we do it. And we measure the corresponding rates. For each substrate concentration, we let the reaction. We start the reaction and measure the rate. OK, now let's plot. And we get a beautiful plot. This is actually called, I don't know whether you can guess, but this is called, oops, a Michaelis Menten plot. And what you see is, in the first place, down here, we have a sort of proportional increase. That is where we are first order. We then go into a plateau phase. This is when we get into zero order of that reaction. But then, OK, how do we get our three key parameters? Vmax, that's the easiest one. Vmax is the rate that we would get when we have infinite amount of substrate. In this case, we would probably say, well, it will plateau around 100 millimolar per minute. So this would be our Vmax. That is where the graph then stops, where it plateaus, where it goes. No more change. OK? Get it. Km over Vmax. No, Vmax over Km, the other way around. Ah, that's a little bit tricky. That is actually the gradient right here, down here. That's Km over Vmax. That's the gradient down here. OK, not great, but maybe we can deal with it. Km, that's the really the biggie, because Km is our affinity. That's what we really want to know. What's the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate? How do we find that? Well, we know that Km is the substrate concentration where we have half of Vmax. So all we need to do is find Vmax. We said it's about 100. Half of Vmax would be 50. So that would be here, half of Vmax. And now we have to find the substrate concentration that, con that, that corresponds, <coughs> for fuck's sake, that corresponds 
to half of the max, and that would be our km point. In this case, probably 25, same unit as the substrate. Make sense? Yeah? So we could use km, or we could find km from this michaelis menten plot. Happy with that? Pretty straightforward. It's only one problem. One little problem which totally Fs the whole thing up. We don't simply know V max. I told you, in this case, it's probably close to 100. But it could be 150. We don't know because we can't extrapolate after what we see. It could be 200. Well, if it was 200, then half of Vmax would be 100. Let's find Km for this 100 half of Vmax. Well, actually, we don't have that on the chart even. The problem with the michaelis menten plot is it is not a straight line. And therefore, it's really almost impossible to figure out what Vmax is. If we can't find Vmax, we can't find half of Vmax. If we can't ha find half of Vmax, we can't find Km. We're snookered. Okay, so let's just simply go home. Actually, no. There's some really cool stuff that you can do with this equation. You can transform the equation. Let's see how you can do that. We have V equals V max times S over Km plus S. That gave us this graph V versus S. And we have what is called a hyperbolic graph, hyperbolic curve. It's shite. Let's be absolutely honest about it. A michaelis menten plot is absolute and utter BS because you can't get a reliable value for Vmax. Little hint, there might be a question in your exam where you will be asked, use an appropriate plot to find Vmax. This wording should ring alarm bells because a michaelis menten graph is not an appropriate plot. Forget it. You should never ever, under any circumstances, use a michaelis menten plot to find Vmax or Km. And even if somebody holds a gun to your head and says, draw a michaelis menten plot, you say, off. Not doing that. That's a criminal offense, using a michaelis menten plot to find Vmax. Trust me, I will punish you if you ever give me a michaelis menten plot. But then, master, how can we deal with that? We need to do a linear transformation of this equation. Sounds far more horrible than it is. One of these linear transformations is you take this equation 
And as a good friend of mine who is from Scotland told me when he showed me how to do that many, many years ago, he said, you turn it upsy tun. Oh, you what? Upsy tun. Now in English? What he meant is you turn it upside down, this equation. So instead of V equals V max times S over Km plus S, you take everything 1 over. So you write 1 over V equals 1 over V max times S divided by Km plus S. Still the same equation is just put it on the head. And what you get is 1 over v equals km plus s divided by v max times s. And what we can do now is we take a hexal and cut this fraction into two. We cut it here. We get Km over Vmax times S plus S over Vmax times S. OK? S cancels out here, at least. What do we do with this guy here? Well, we can write that in a slightly different form. 1 over v equals km over v max times 1 over s plus 1 over Vmax. Happy with that? Haven't done any, any weird stuff? Didn't lose anything? Didn't change the sign? And you think, welcome to Facebook, WTF. What is that going to do for us? Ha! Here comes the magic. What? Here comes the magic. That's actually the equation for a straight line. So what do we plot? We plot, on our y-axis, we plot 1 over v, 1 over the rate. On the x-axis, we plot 1 over s. And we get a straight line, something like that. The gradient of this straight line would be Km over Vmax. True? What's the intercept? One over Vmax. Hey, cool. We get one over Vmax, which we can easily convert into a Vmax. It's just taking it one over. We get even, well, we get Km over Vmax. We would like to have Vmax over Km, but we just simply invert that, and we get Vmax over Km. Where the heck is Km? Find Wally. Uh, find Km. Well, you find Km 
When you extend this graph into the negative range, and then the intercept here gives us minus 1 over Km. We would like to have Km, but again, 1 over Km is the next best thing. We get it minus, but bear in mind, Km is a substrate concentrate. Km can never be minus. <coughs> Does that make sense? This plot actually has a name. It's called a double reciprocal. Double reciprocal plot. Or after the name of the people who came up with this glorious idea, it's also called a line weaver Burke plot. This is the plot that you find in basically every single biochemical textbook. An LB line with a Burke plot. That's the one that you find. Let's see how this would look like when we plot it with our data. Let me just get rid of all that crap here. More crap. So here again are our are our substrate and rate data. And what I've done next to it is I just simply did one divided by substrate and one divided by rate. So these are the data here. In these columns, just simply 1 divided by substrate or 1 divided by rate. And that gives me the data. Let's see how this plot looks like. Hey, cool, look at that. We have our line with a Burke plot. And it is a beautifully straight line. How cool is that? So, what have we got? We've got... <coughs> our gradient here. Km over Vmax. We got our 1 over Vmax here. So no more guessing like we have to do with the michaels menten plot. We get a decent Vmax. And if we extend that, let's say with a trend line function in Excel, we would get minus 1 over Km. Make sense? How cool is that? We've just transformed this horrible michaelis menten plot into a straight line. Typical line weaver Burke plot. Biochemists are happy as Larry. Tell you who is not happy with it. Klapper. It's not because Klapper is awkward. But a line with a Burke plot, which you will find time and time and time again, has some serious flaws. For example, you've got a point like that here. 
from the thing that we discussed about regression analysis, can you remember what this point is? Is this point that I just indicated, is this close to the other points? No. If we just make a tiny little mistake in this one, our entire graph might change. This is called an influential point. If you've got influential points, you are vulnerable to big mistakes in measurements. Also, you have a bunching of data here. They are all very, very close together. And you can't probably read very well this 1 over v max, not just because I was you know, scribbling here. But look at, look at the scale. Getting 1 over v max from that is near to impossible. Line with a Berg plot is slightly better than a Michaelis Menten plot. But let's face it, still shite. But it's used so often. You will encounter that. You can't even do proper sort of statistical analysis with that, because what you get is all the values are 1 over. No statistical analysis pop possible with 1 over. It's a nightmare. OK, then we go home. Actually, no, we don't go home. I promise you to go home, huh? There is another kind of linear transformation for that. I'm not showing you how to do that. It's a second version. This thing is called an Eddy Hofstay plot. As I said, I'm not going to show you how to derive that. I, I'll do a video tutorial to show you how it's derived. but. The equation for an Eddy Hofstay plot is V, the rate, equals minus Km times V over S plus V max. And again, <laughs> Y equals M x plus c. Thank you. Yep, you're absolutely right. It's the concentration of s. So what do we do? We plot our rate on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we plot v over s with square brackets. Now, does the plot go up or does it go down? It goes down, absolutely right, because we have minus Km. So it goes down like that. The gradient of our plot is minus Km. What's the intercept with the y axis? That's Vmax. Absolutely right. And if you do the maths, well, we're not doing that here. This point here gives us Vmax over Km. Hey, look at that. How cool is that? 
It's easy. You don't have to do anything one divided by crap. You just get the data as you would like them. Vmax, OK, we've got minus km, but it's easy to forget about the, K, the, 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 the minus sign in this case. You get Vmax over km. Vmax, substrate very high. Vmax over km, substrate very low. Km, affinity. Tots easy. What does it look like in our beautiful plot here? Now, on the y-axis, we have to do a little bit of calculation. We have to calculate the rate divided by the substrate concentration. So that needs a little bit of attention. But the rate then, well, we just simply copy the, 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 the numbers from here. Let's plot that dude. Hey, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And what you see is if we extend that, we immediately get our Vmax. We take the gradient. Well, actually, what we can do is we can take the gradient here here. So 100 divided by 4 gives us 25. We get immediately our Km. And this point here gives us our Vmax over Km. Job done. Life is good. Look at that. How many influential points do we have? Do we have any? No. Hey makes it statistically sound. Do we have any data bunching? No. Makes it even better. How cool is that? Don't have to worry about anything. And the really nice thing is we get our data, we get our information straight away. We don't have to do any weird transformation at the end like we have to do with the line with a birth plot. That means we can do statistics with it. <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah? So, Eddie Hofstay plot, the plot. Why don't people use it? There's one slight problem with it. <coughs> Theoretically, it's one of these weird plots which you should never use. Because I told you when we did regression, on the y-axis, you plot the dependent variable. On the x-axis, you plot the independent variable. And in order to do something, properly with it, the independent variable is independent of the dependent. Or in other words, the dependent variable is only dependent on the independent variable. But in this case here, we not only have the independent, the S, we have V over S. We have a mixture of dependent and independent variable which to many, many people makes it incredibly suspect. This is a weird plot. Technically, it shouldn't exist. 
But some people, clever people, use this plot to find Vmax Km and Vmax over Km. I want you to be clever when it comes to that. Are you happy with that? We have covered so much today. What I really want you to get out of it is what is Vmax, Vmax over Km, Km, how to find them with an Eddie Hofstede plot, and how to find a turnover number, and what do these three parameters actually tell us? Those of you who are doing BI308, I see you tomorrow. Have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>